Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so glad that you could join us this morning, and hopefully we'll have a few more guests. Um, we often have uh, 15 or 20 total, but sometimes they straggle in as, as time goes on. So um, I'm Mary Ann Haverhill, the chair of the committee and also the chair of the Community Foundation of the Valleys Board of Directors and otherwise active in the Valley um, and in the community in a variety of projects. So um, for those of you who might be newer to our committee, um, just to let you know that in the last, I don't know, year, year and a half or so, we've been focusing a lot of our attention on housing development, um, particularly focusing on um, housing development for, um, kind of, they call it, I think it's mid-range housing or whatever, for those that are nurses and, and first responders and teachers and young professionals and so on, just because the cost of housing is gone sky high. And um, because there just needs to be more development and how can we be advocates for more development in our region? Um, I'm sure you'll hear from our SCAG friends that um, the state and SCAG have come up with new housing development requirements for the city of Los Angeles and for basically for every city and county in the state of California, much more aggressive than in the past. And there's now accountability built in. Um, when I worked for the LA Economic Development Corporation, we did a project where we visited lots of cities in the county of LA. And we learned that some cities are very progressive in terms of their housing development and others are kind of sitting in their laurels and saying, oh, we're kind of landlocked and we really can't do anything. At any rate, so, um, but we really do need more housing if we're gonna really keep people here. And from an employment perspective, uh, since the Valley Economic Alliance works with a lot of employers in the Valley, they're concerned that there's enough housing for the people that they hire or that they bring in um, to their companies. So that's a critical um, uh, need and interest on the part of our employers. So at any rate, we look forward to hearing from our friends at SCAG. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, do we want to just quickly, I think we have time today to quickly just go around and introduce ourselves and, and name the company or organization that you represent. Um, so I'm going to start with, I think, Robert Wong. I see your name. I don't see your face, but I assume you're on your phone. But can you introduce yourself to us? Yeah, uh, Robert Wong with uh, Department of Transportation. Oh, great. Good. Oh, Welcome. Uh, SCAC's uh, Housing Academy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Asia System. Okay. Um, Jaime, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Jaime Del Rio and I'm with Abundant House in LA. Great. Claudia, good to see you again. Well, actually I see your name, but um, <laughs> good to have you with us again. There you are. Oh. Whoops, sorry about that. Should be up by now. Yeah. <laughs> Claudia Don Martinez with UCLA Health. Great to be here this morning. Thank you for joining us. Melina. Oh, unmute yourself, please. Hello, Melina. Okay, well, go on. John C. If you could introduce yourself. Uh, I have to mute myself. It's a little loud. I'm in a coffee shop. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a little soft, but yeah. Uh, so I'm in modular home building and land development. I'm just listening to you guys. Uh, okay. Just uh, seeing what you guys are talking about. Thanks for having right. me. So did I hear you say you're in home development? That's what you do? Yeah, residential. Residential. Okay, great. Well, good. You're in the right place. That sounds great. Um, Oscar. Hello there. Can you hear me? Oh, now I can hear. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Hello. Good morning. And who do you represent? I'm with Build LACCD, the Capital Improvement uh, Program uh, for the LA Community College District. I'm the okay. outreach coordinator. Yep. Good. All right. We, we hope our community colleges, for those of you who are unaware, about 20% of community college students are unhoused. And um, some of the community colleges in our region do have land that could be built. And there are actually models of that. And there's incentives now from the state to, to uh, build more housing for students. So uh, glad to have you with us. Nancy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that's something that we are going to, we're taking a look at uh, right now for, for, for the future. So, so definitely why we're, why we're here. Thank you. Good. Awesome. Nancy. Nancy, can't hear you.
Nancy, Nancy Starzik. Okay, hello, I can see you, but we can't hear you. <laughs> so sorry. That's okay. Okay, and who do you represent? Um, well, several, uh, the Chamber of Commerce for Santa Clarita and Southland Regional Association of Realtors and the Porter Valley Business Alliance. Great, wonderful. All right, Steve. Oh, can't hear you. There you go. There we go. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry, I just joined here. Uh, yes. I'm with uh, Current Energy. We're a uh, we're a new member of the association, and uh, we're a solar developer based out of Van Nuys. Wonderful. Okay, Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Cruz, and I'm with the Southland Regional Association of Realtors. Great, Diane. Uh, hi, my name is Diane. I am a landlord, and I have seen a lot of issues come up and so I'm trying to be proactive with organizations like yours to hopefully forestall some problems that have been done in certain areas that hopefully we won't reinstate in others. Okay, great, thank you. Ruben. Good morning, uh, Ruben Rodriguez, I'm a Executive Director of Pueblo Salud, which translates into community and health and we're a private nonprofit organization uh, dealing more that with drugs, tobacco, and alcohol abuse prevention. Right. It's obviously right. the consequences of some of that, which is homelessness. Yes, yes. And Ruben, I think you and I have had contact in years past when I was at MEND. Oh, yeah. yes, of yes. course. How are you doing? <laughs> yes, Pueblo uh, Salud. Yeah, we worked yeah. together on a number of things. So good to, good to see you again. Thank you for like, joining like, us. Likewise, likewise. Yes. Audrey. Oh, can't hear you, Audrey. Uh, I'm Audrey Simons. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of San Fernando Community Health Center. We're a federally qualified health center. And as Ruben said, um, we sometimes deal with the results of the stresses of un being unhoused in our health center. And since I feel sustainable communities is a major portion of health, Mm -hmm. uh, long-term public health. Uh, we're very interested in that aspect. Great, right. good. Karen. Good morning, everyone. Karen Swift with Cedar sinai It's a little bit of a reunion for me. I um, worked with Jenna at Metro for six and a half years, so oh, go be back with um, Valley Economic Alliance. So I will say now I'm at Cedars, where both mobility and housing are social determinants of health. So it all leads back together, right? I feel like the it issues does. I'm working on are the same. I'm just meeting folks at a different point in their journey. Sure. So nice yeah. Great, great. Yes, there certainly is a connection. So Rosalind? Okay, I'm, sorry, I'm on a on a call right now, so okay. I just have this on in the background. Okay. Um, All right, well, we'll connect with you later. Great. Um, let me see. We'll come to you in a moment, Bruce. So we'll wait on you, um, and then let me see. Um, our guests will actually wait on Jacob and Jenna, so we'll be introducing you shortly. Um, so our C, um, our Community Foundation. I mean, rather the uh, Economic Alliance staff. Um, Jackie, you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. I'm Jackie Matsumoto at the Valley Economic Alliance, Director of Investor Relations. Great. And Erica? Oh, thank you, Marianne. I'm Erica Gass with the Valley Economic Alliance, Vice President of Operations. Wonderful. And Sonia, we all know and love, but if you want to say anything, you're welcome to. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, um, I would like to, I, I will end my comments by uh, introducing Bruce, though. Is it okay. time for me to go Sounds ahead good. and do that? Great. Okay. Wonderful. Oh my gosh, Marianne, thank you so much for your wonderful leadership and support framing, um, you know, what we're, what we're working on, what we're talking about and so interested in. It's just awesome having you as chair of our Livable and Sustainable Communities Committee. And welcome to everyone. I want to add uh, my welcome to Marianne's and the teams. And it's great to see new faces, new to me, and, and um, let's say friendly faces. No old faces. I see no old faces. I see new and friendly. <laughs> So wonderful, Karen and Steve, welcome to the family of investors at the Alliance and everyone um, and Jessica, welcome uh, to our board and um, really, really excited to have everybody here with us. So a little bit of background, the Livable and Sustainable Communities Committee convenes thought leaders on topics of interest 
um, uh, pertaining to quality of life issues. So as Marianne alluded to, employers are very interested in housing and other topics as well that uh, kind of create the environment for which their employees will, will be uh, experiencing and will be living in. And um, uh, items such as, or topics such as environmental sustainability, as well as housing, homelessness, public health, public safety, other factors um, that just create the communities that we live in. And housing is such a critical determining factor for the health of local economies as employers are interested in where their employees will be living and how easy or difficult it may be to retain and attract employees. So uh, very, uh, very important. Um, uh, I'm gonna put in the chat a couple of uh, uh, links here. I wanna put, first of all, my contact information. So I've been on board with the Alliance for about two years now as president and CEO and uh, super thrilled with all the initiatives that we're working on. There's information about some of our work on housing that I just put in the chat. And just so that you have the context within this committee, um, we also have our Economic Development Committee, which oversees our business assistance program, community revitalization, business attraction, and tourism strategy. So if any of those interest you, you might want to check out that particular committee. If you are a business owner or you know of a business owner who could use some free business assistance connecting to capital and marketing expertise and a whole host of different um, types of assistance, then I put the chat in the chat, uh, the link where you can get more information about that. And then finally, we do have an education and workforce development committee working on developing our talent pool and a diversity committee, which is reaching out to diverse communities to help diversify the business owners that participate in our free business assistance. And they are collaborating uh, on Juneteenth programs for this weekend. So I encourage you to uh, check those out. I'm gonna put in the chat a link to all of our upcoming events, committees, um, Juneteenth events and others right there in the chat at thevalley.net slash events. So if you have other questions, do feel free to reach out. Um, just so, so very excited about what we're going to be hearing about from our presenters today. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce another member of our board of directors and an investor in the Valley Economic Alliance and in our community. Uh, Bruce Gumbiner is Senior Vice President, Risk Manager, and CRA Officer. That stands for Community Reinvestment Act Officer. Um, and we're just so thrilled that we get to have amazing leaders here in the Valley involved with our alliance, all contributing toward a better alliance, a stronger economy, and a more prosperous, environmentally sustainable, and equitable region. So I thank you, Bruce, for being a leader uh, and a partner with us uh, in those endeavors. And turn the mic over to you, Bruce. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, and good morning. Uh, I'd just like to say it's an honor and a pleasure to be here to introduce Jenna Hornstock. Um, as Sonia said, I'm Bruce Gumbiner, Senior Vice President, Risk Manager, and CRE Officer for American Business Bank. Uh, ABB is a local commercial bank serving middle markets in the LA, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties. In the background uh, of the bank, it was inspired by the philosophy that the bank could be more than a sum of its siloed parts. Our founders set out to build a kind of bank, one that worked as a singular entity on behalf of its clients, providing continuity in all aspects of banking and finance. From that idea, in 1998, American Business Bank was born. Our founders recognized that middle market companies are in need of bankers that could offer meaningful consultative relationships and comprehensive advisement. So ABB took action, fostering relationships with businesses across the Southland that continue to this day. Our genuine interest and passion has always been the driving force of our success. It's how we continue to build a legacy that quietly influences the way premier Southern California businesses operate and grow for years to come. But enough about ABB. Let me tell you about the real celebrity that's here today, and that's Jenna Hornstock. Ms. Hornstock is the Deputy Director of Planning, Land Use of Southern California Association of Governments, you, you heard earlier referred to as SCAG. She is an honorary member of AIA, holds a master's in public policy from Harvard University's 
Kennedy School of, Grad, of Government and a BA in Rhetoric from uh, UC Berkeley. Jenna joined SCAG in 2020 to lead the Special Initiatives in Housing Economic Empowerment, as well as the Sustainable and Resilient Development Departments. Prior to joining SCAG, Jenna had served as LA's, LA Metro's Executive Officer for Transit-Oriented Communities, where she oversaw 15 active real estate development projects, station area urban design, and first last mile planning. Jenna also spent nearly seven years at the community development, uh, uh, community redevelopment agency of the Los An of the city of Los Angeles. Most recently, as chief strategic planning and economic as chief of strategic planning and development. Sorry, want to get that right. Um, and in her spare time, like it sounds like she doesn't have any, um, but Jenna is a planning commissioner for the city of Los Angeles and serves as a board member of the nonprofit community health councils and the ULA. ULILA Advisory Board. She lives in the Silver Lake area with her teenage son and her partner and practices yoga and the Lindy Hop whenever possible. So now I'm pleased to turn over the virtual podium to Jenna Hornstock. Well, thank you, Bruce. That was a very long, long and, and exonerated introduction. So thank you. And I have to just say hi to Karen because in my time at Metro, she and I we locked arms a lot and, and, and did a lot of great work in the Valley actually. So um, good to see you all. And I just, I wanna take a moment and to have Jacob Noonan also introduce himself. He just joined our team and the program we're gonna be talking about today in particular, um, Jacob came on to, to lead uh, that program development and implementation. So if you wanna give a hello, Jacob. Yes, with pleasure. It's it's great to be here with you all this morning. I, I I certainly won't spend as much time as as Bruce did on introducing Jenna. What a wonderful background bio. Um, I am coming on to Skag, uh, uh, many years of experience in housing and and development, and I'm going to be leading our uh, our our funding strategies under. <laughs> Regional Early Action Program uh, 2.0, which Jenna will cover more in a presentation to you all, but specifically those housing investments that we're looking to explore and to stand up throughout the greater Southern California region through our housing supportive infrastructure programs and our, our uh, sub-regional partnership programs, both focused around housing and economic empowerment. Pleasure to be here. Back to you, Jenna. Okay. Great, so I am gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. We checked that and it worked, so let's make sure. Good, we can see it, Sonia, yes, thumbs up. Yeah, okay. Yes, looks great. Great, great. all right. Um, so again, I'm, I'm gonna talk today about the Regional Early Action Planning Grant or REAP 2021. We also call this REAP 2.0 because uh, we had an earlier REAP grant. Uh, and hold on, why is it not letting me? move the screen. Sometimes I'm in the wrong place and it's not letting me, there it goes. Um, it's not moving yet. Ah, I'm having a technical difficulty already. It's I'm clicking the arrow and it's not moving. Hold on. Maybe the down arrow on your keyboard might. I'll try that. Yeah, I'm clicking the arrow on the Zoom. Um, shoot. Why is it not moving? I'm going to stop sharing for one second and see why, see if it's on my end. Yeah, it seems like it's um, this document. I should note that I'm also having weird internet stuff this morning. I've, um, let me try something else. Oh, no, oh, it's freaking out about, okay, resume slideshow. Oh, I got it. So now I'm going to share again. All right, brief, brief technical difficulty may be fixed. 2.0, let's do it, 2.0. 2.0, all right, let's do it. All right, there we go. Okay, in case you don't know who SCAG is, I wanna give you a quick overview of who we are, uh, a program overview. I'm gonna share with you how we at SCAG are structuring this large grant that we're getting from the state. Um, and then I'm gonna dive into our housing supportive infrastructure program. That's the larger program that Jacob is setting up for us and, and that we'll be running. And then I'm going to dive into one in particular I picked out just for this group to talk about because I thought you would all be pretty interested in that one. Um, so just SCAG, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization um, for Southern California for six counties. You can see here on the map the, the counties we cover. And MPOs are, are federally designated for urbanized areas over 50,000. We are the largest in the country. You can see here we cover 191 cities and six counties, uh, about 19 million people, almost half the state's population. 
And I want to note, importantly, we have about 67% of the state's disadvantaged um, lower income communities, um, but we are a giant powerhouse in terms of our economy. Now, the things SCAG traditionally does are primarily designated by state and federal law. So a lot of the things we do, we are required statutorily to do. The big, big one um, is that every four years, we develop the Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP, that's federally designated. And all MPOs across the country do that. But in California, um, because of SB 375, we also do the Sustainable Community Strategy. So jointly, we call this the RTP SES. It's the big thing that we do every four years. The, the last one we adopted in 2020 is called Connect SoCal. Um, and we are currently in the process of working on um, Connect SoCal 2024. We also hold the Federal Transportation Improvement Plan, or FTIP, and I can tell you one of the most important things I learned about the FTIP when I worked at Metro, I didn't really know what it was, um, is that if you want to get state or federal funding for transportation improvements, you, you got to be in that FTIP. Your project needs to be identified in there, and we do update that regularly. Um, but it's really kind of a master list of proposed larger uh, transportation projects and investments. Um, we also, uh, was mentioned earlier, we um, do the regional housing needs allocation for the region, um, we, or we allocate the numbers. So we get a number from the state, they say for your six counties, this is the number of new housing units, and we go through a very robust process, develop a methodology, and then allocate the arena to each city and county, which if any of you have tracked can be a pretty controversial process, um, but the, the, we are currently in the sixth cycle of the arena, um, our, our allocation covers eight years, 2021 to 2029. Um, and you all are in mostly in the city of LA we're talking about. So the city got the largest arena of over 450,000, about 455,000 new units of housing be produced by 2029. We're a big holder of data and information. Like a lot of folks come to us, we, are, we have GIS and modeling experts and we look at growth and growth forecasting and population changes and uh, projection of jobs and household growth. Um, we, we crunch all kinds of numbers and data for the region, so we're a big resource for that. And importantly, we're really a forum for issues of regional significance. So our regional council, which is our board, is made up of 86 elected officials from across uh, the whole, you know, Southern California. And then we have various policy committees. So if you want to get something in front of elected officials, we are a great place to come uh, and really convene on larger topics. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Regional Early Action Planning Grant. Uh, or REAP, REAP 2021, um, we had a REAP 1 that was designated from, from AB 101, which was state funding, and it was focused on land use planning to support housing development and to accelerate housing production. And it was also focused, because this was in 2019, in helping our region get their housing elements done, right? So every, we're not going to, I wasn't planning on getting deep into the RENA process today. That could be a whole separate, separate talk if we want that. Um, but when you get the arena, you then have to reflect that number in your updated housing element, right, at the city level. Um, so the first batch of funding, we got 47 million and we sub-allocated to partners to do this land use planning. REAP 21 uh, came, you know, kind of as a surprise to everybody. It was part of the May 21 state budget revised. 600 million was set aside by the state. Um, and, and it's primarily from federal funding. They were anticipating federal um, recovery act funds. So this is one time funding. About 30 million um, is going to a rural set aside uh, program which doesn't apply to the city of LA. 30 million is statewide competitive program for any eligible entity. But the focus that I'm gonna talk about today is this 500 million of federal funding that's formula allocated to MPOs. So my, and SCAG is your MPO and it's population based um, the formula allocation so we are getting 246 million. And I just, to give you a sense of the magnitude, that's about double our annual budget, nearly double. And, and the reason our annual budget is as large as it is right now is because we got that one time $47 million grant from REAP1. So this is giant um, for us and for our region. But importantly, because this is federal funding, we need to obligate the funds by June of 24 and expend them by June of 26. So the REAP program, this is from the trailer bill language and then the draft program guidelines um, that came out in March from the state. Uh, it is for transformative planning and implementation activities. And it's got four required objectives. And we know they're different from REAP 1. A lot, a lot of the stakeholders we talked to participated in, in REAP 1. REAP 1 was for, for this land use and planning to accelerate housing production. REAP 2 is, is beyond just straight up only um, housing and land use planning. It can also be spent on implementation. So it can go into the ground, 
Um, but importantly, we have to show these four objectives, coronavirus economic recovery. So showing um, that we are targeting and helping uh, communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, accelerating infill housing development, reducing vehicle miles traveled and affirmatively furthering fair housing. And if AFFH is a new term for you, affirmatively furthering fair housing, that is defined in state law and housing elements this cycle are required to have a whole section uh, about affirmatively furthering fair housing. So the good news is our cities are, are telling us what those plans are. So we have a, a roadmap there. Um, but it's, it's important to note that right now, in terms of the most recent guidance from the state, we believe that these ands are important, meaning the projects that get funded have to check all four. To be frank, we've been arguing that it's so much money and, and we need to be so broad in our thinking that, that we think on the totality, our application and the projects we fund should do all four versus project by project. So we're, we're still dancing in that space of trying to figure that out. We are waiting for final guidance from the state, but for now, our understanding it's these ands, that you have to hit all four of these objectives in the work that we do. So um, to, to try to grapple with this large chunk of funding and, and think about how we're going to do this work, I mean, most of you, you're, you might not know, but we're not an implementing entity, right? We don't have land use control. We don't do lending and put money in projects. We, we generally, um, sometimes we do studies, um, but we, we generally sub-allocate funds to partners and implementing bodies. Um, and, and a lot of that are cities and counties, although we have gone um, more broad in some recent programming that I'll mention. So when we looked at this program, we identified three large program areas where we wanna focus our program development. So the first are early action initiatives. And we call this that because we already, we adopted our sustainable community strategy in 2020. We have an implementation plan and we, we have some early action initiatives, some stuff we've been working on um, that we wanna put this money toward because we hadn't identified money and we think it's consistent. And I just wanna note, since I noted that we do have some foundations and community-based um, type groups here. Um, one of the programs in this early action initiative that we're developing, we're calling call number four. We do these calls for projects and we're very fancy. We name them one, two, three, four. Um, but this one is the call for civic, uh, for civic engagement, equity and environmental justice. And we are looking, and we are in the process of doing uh, program guidelines. We've been holding a lot of large meetings, particularly with nonprofits and community-based organizations. Um, and this program is looking to fund um, cities um, and or counties um, with um, nonprofit and community-based partners to do planning work that again would meet those four objectives. So we're looking to have draft guidelines. And just, I wanna note this, the draft guidelines will go to our first policy committee um, in July, and we hope to have final guidelines in September. So we are gonna be releasing a grant program focused on planning and, and engagement and equity rooted activities um, that really could be a good match for some of the folks that I heard are on this call. Um, so we'll, you'll have our info if you wanna get connected to get more information or get on the mailing list for that, you'll have our emails and we'll make sure you get, uh, cause I'm not gonna focus too much on that for the rest of the presentation. Um, there are some other early action initiatives we're looking at um, relate to data and some of the data work we do and particularly to do some of the performance monitoring and measuring for this program. Um, as well as some of you may have heard of our Go Human program, which was similarly a partnership with uh, community-based organizations and cities to do small kind of micro projects at the neighborhood level, looking at um, bike and pedestrian safety. So they would set up these kind of pop-up uh, safety kits in communities um, and really focusing on getting the message, this Go Human message out about um, safety, bike and ped safety. So we're looking to expand that program. It's been really um, successful uh, across the region. This the second program, this is going to be a large program, is our County Transportation Commission or CTC partnership program. So your CTC is LA Metro, um, but we have them, uh, we have six of them across our six counties. Uh, so working with them, they would be developing some project lists and just really sub allocating uh, funding to the CTCs to do work that they've identified that, that meet these various goals of the program. And that we're going to focus on today is the housing supportive infrastructure program. So this is a large bucket um, that we've identified for various housing programs. Um, and I'm gonna focus in, um, oh, I did have another slide on the early action initiatives. I think I, I talked through this with you. I mean, the, the important thing to know is we're developing uh, uh, guidelines for these early action initiatives. Um, the partnership program we're working on directly with the CTCs, but here's where I wanted to go. On the Housing Supportive Infrastructure Program, we've identified four areas that we want to focus on program development. So what you're seeing in front of you are not specific programs, but more 
ideas. So we're going to figure out how to develop these um, programs. And the first one, and this is the one that we're going to come back to and spend more time on today, is infrastructure and utilities to support housing development, particularly looking at sewer and electric and stormwater, things that aren't that sexy on their face, but I think, as a lot of you know, are really important to actually deliver housing and make it uh, more, more timely, uh, more efficient, less expensive. Um, and importantly, if we can think of this at a systems level, then we can think about climate resiliency um, and sustainability. Um, preservation comes up as a big topic um, that's, well, it's been talked about for decades, but we've, we're seeing a lot of work in this space around existing affordable housing whose covenants are expiring, but also what we call NOAA or naturally occurring affordable housing, which are kind of, I, I know we have a landlord on the call, some of the existing units that might be rent controlled or the rents are kind of reasonable um, because of the neighborhood or, or for whatever historical reasons, but those buildings are being bought up and flipped. And so we're losing this natural um, you know, stock of affordable housing that we have. So there's, we are currently pursuing a white paper to look at some best practices and where are there gaps in the market to think about how we can support that work. Um, we've had a lot of interest in housing trust funds, um, in particular, if we can funnel money there. And I, I'm gonna remind you again, we don't do lending. We don't hold covenants on affordable housing. So if we wanna put money into projects more directly, housing trust funds, are a great way to get some regional impact that can then they can put the money you know, into projects um, right, that are, are going into the ground. And um, then importantly, one of the big things SCAG does all the time is technical assistance. Um, so we're talking to our cities and counties about what kind of technical assistance they need. They're all working on their housing elements. So we know that they need to do more land use planning to realize their housing elements. Um, we've put out and are hearing some interest in surplus land development. So helping cities take their publicly owned land and develop that for housing. And, and if some of you were around when we had redevelopment, that loss of redevelopment really took away capacity for a lot of our cities uh, to develop their publicly owned land. So how can we help them build that back up? Uh, and then renter assistance, um, we, we're asking around, that was something new we didn't know was eligible under the program, but in fact it is. Um, so that's what happened here. So we are looking to um, make sure that um, we can support those efforts across the region. So this is our focus today. I wanna to dive deeper into this program, although I'm gonna check the chat. That's what I was trying to check. Okay, I just wanna make sure I didn't have any, um, I'm looking at the chat to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Okay, got it. All right, so uh, we're gonna focus on this infrastructure and utilities uh, program. So why utility investments? So our six cycle housing element, and I, I think most of you, since this is the San Fernando Valley, a lot of you are city of LA, and I heard we even had Santa Clarita on today. I don't know where your status of your housing element is. I know that LA City, any minute is about to have a final certified compliant housing element. Uh, we only have 15 in our region of our 197. Uh, our cities and counties are struggling to produce these housing elements, but the reason is they are robust. The sixth cycle of housing elements is unlike any other ones we've seen. And what's important to know is the site inventory. What our cities and counties have to do is say, here's where we're gonna meet our arena, here's sites. I mean, if you're a developer, you can go in there and just start looking at areas in a housing element of where the city has said we're gonna you know, produce housing. So we have a roadmap for 1.3 million units of housing in our region. And as we know, utilities are a basic requirement and, and, and it was mentioned, I'm on the city planning commission, but even before that, um, I've done public private real estate for the better part of 20 years. And let me tell you, it, it's all of a sudden when it's like, oh God, a transformer has to be upgraded to help this project and you don't find out till the tail end or you know, the sewer capacity isn't there um, to, to fund this. Or a lot of folks that are in a opposition to housing when they come out to commission say, we don't have the utilities right, to support this project. It's a, it's a big deal, but we don't, I, I haven't really seen it addressed systemically and holistically. We don't have a lot of up-to-date data uh, and location and capacities. It's not kind of broadly known. And a lot of these upgrades happen on a project by project level. That's more costly, it's more timely, it creates risk and uncertainty. I think this is you know, a business focused group. Uh, so you know, nobody likes risk and uncertainty. Um, and importantly, if we wanna think about sustainability and climate resiliency, we have to think at a systems level, right? Not a project by project level. So we have this big question and we don't have answers to it, but how is the best way to design a program that has maximal impact that facilitates the most housing, where we can think about racial equity, where we're not just making investments, you know, where we traditionally have, uh, but really thinking holistically about lifting up communities, where we have a model for sustainable and climate adaptive investments, 
where we have a giant region, we cover six counties. So we have to think geographically about what makes sense, right? Different needs in different places. And we want to leverage other investments in planning and capital projects. And particularly there's a lot of federal money flowing right now. So we're exploring this question and I want to invite you all to participate. Um, we're going to hold an industry forum in fall of 2022. Um, we're going to bring in national experts. We're going to get people talking. We hope to get people sitting at tables together like utilities and public works people and, and developers and, and folks at the community level working on these issues. Um, and we're hoping that this is an incubator for ideas because then we're gonna release an RFI or possibly a direct RFP to crowdsource ideas. The idea is to get people thinking and then pitch projects that we can fund with our REAP dollars and really think about disrupting this space and think about transformative projects. So I wanted to offer up what you could do if you're interested, participate in our industry forum, identify partners, bring your ideas, and then if you've got them, you know, respond to this open call that we're going to put out um, for, for projects and programs. So I wanted to leave um, on that note um, as just trying to identify a place. We can put our emails in the chat. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing and then I just want to open it up to questions. And if you want to dive into other parts of the program, I'm happy to share with you our thinking. I was picking one to focus in on today. Fantastic. That's such great information. It's uh, amazing. SCAG is such an amazing resource and the geographic reach is, is immense. It's uh, uh, incredible yeah. to think about. And the yeah. potential of this funding is really exciting. At the Alliance, we actually have five member cities, um, mm -hmm. Burbank, Glendale, okay. Calabasas, and the city of San Fernando, in addition to the San Fernando Valley region right. of the city of Los Angeles, which as you right. said, is our biggest region, but we do have yeah. Those, yeah. all of those. So um, so this is exciting. Um, love to see any questions from the chat if anybody yeah. uh, would like to have more info and kind of weigh in. Yeah. I know, um, uh, I don't know if it's uh, exactly on topic. Marianne has been participating in a housing advocacy program as well, which is another program that some folks might be interested in. We can also um, touch on that a little bit if there are additional, if you'd like to get more people participating in that one as well, feel free. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, should I answer some questions that I see in the chat or some comments? Yes, please. Sure, okay. So first, um, Diane, I am very aware that REAP is also the rent escrow assistance program. Un unfortunately, that was a state designated name. Um, and. Uh, that, that program is, I think, particular to LA City, although I don't know if other cities have it. I'm aware of that program, so that was one we couldn't really control. Uh, but I, you're, you're the first person to raise that, though, but I'm aware. Um, thank you, um, Carr, for lobbying for those funds. <laughs> uh, Jacob pasted here how you can find info about um, the Sustainable Communities Program, particularly Call for. So and I want to just say generally, if you all are comfortable, we could get your emails and put you on our mailing list if you want to just keep apprised of what's happening with the REAP program. We just we don't do that without your permission. But if you're, you're good with it, we're happy to just make sure you're getting updates from us. We also have a monthly housing newsletter that goes out um, that we've started in the last year. Um, let me look at one more question. Utilities, are we talking? So we have started talking. Um, to them about this program in general and to engage them in the um, industry forum and thinking about hopefully getting ex people excited if they have some ideas they wanna pursue. Um, but yes, you're talking about kind of the dig once. Yes, dig once is definitely a priority. And when we do this industry forum, we're gonna have a final report. And I can already tell you that'll be one of the things lifted up is Anytime there's digging going on, how can we make sure we're addressing also the utilities if it's possible, you know, to do so? And again, this this is anecdotal, but the county of LA has expressed interest in doing a sewer master plan uh, because they need a lot more information about sewer lines needed for growth. So if you think of it this way, if there's a sewer master plan and then somebody's digging somewhere in unincorporated county or one of the cities that they're able to cover all of their cities then you could look at that plan and see if there's a way, right, to dig one, so Marianne, to your point. So I think that's an important one. Um, I see Nancy's hand up. I don't see any more questions. Um, I just wanted to mention um, a member of the California Association of Realtors. I'm, I'm a director, and we're looking at somewhere between three and a half to four million units shy. So this is great. Um, you know, it, it's a start, but it takes so long uh, the regulations and all of the 
uh, red tape that we see. We have, we've gone to bat. I know I've put together a list of 19 ideas to speed up the process of housing. Um, and I've given it to every single legislator I can think of, county, local city council members, all the way up to congressional members. Um, and I seems like nobody ever pays attention. But um, I wanted to mention that we are focusing very hard on reuse or readapting um, commercial and industrial underutilized commercial right. and industrial areas. So, you know, we we have 182 bills that we're working on. So wow. it's, a, it's a lot for us. We try to focus on the most onerous and the most rapidly um, what effective methods and bills. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just excited to hear that you're working on this. And, and to answer your question, Santa Clarita is doing very well with their arena numbers. Uh, Santa Clarita is one of the biggest areas for growth. We have about 45, 46,000 units that are coming wow. in the next uh, right. seven, eight years. So we, we still see a lot of growth up there. Yeah. Um, however, I, I we, we in Los Angeles City, all over California, actually, we really have a huge deficit of yeah. of homes, yeah. and yeah. the lion's share is in Los Angeles County. Yeah. I, Nancy, two things. One, I'd love to see your list that you've put together. Okay, um, and, I, and, yeah, I would love to be included. I don't know if. Um, we can give our emails, but I, you have my yeah, permission. Yeah. I'd like to, I would really like to be included because, you know, this has been yeah. for me, it's like a, it's close to a 30 year process. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would like to get as much information as I can. And I'll share with you. My, my ideas are local all the way up to federal. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. it doesn't cover everything that you would be yeah. addressing, sure. but they're ideas. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, and just two things. We, we didn't talk today about REAP 1, and I, I'm wondering, I, I, we don't want to take over all your meetings, but um, if you wanted some more information on what we're doing with our REAP 1 program, I can, we can send over, we do biannual status reports, and we're doing one next month. You, we, you can get a laundry list of what we're funding, but, but Nancy, I just want, hopefully this will make you smile. One of the things we're doing is we're launching a development streamlining toolkit. So not new legislative ideas, but looking at best practices, because a lot of our cities, again, we, we focus a lot on cities as our customer. Um, some cities are more ahead of the game than others in using state tools and density bonuses and CEQA streamlining tools, and even how they do administrative approvals, what they make ministerial, right, versus not. And so this, we're developing a series of six workshops. We have an outside consultant who's amazing, um, as well as some tools. So that isn't done yet, but we surveyed all our cities to find out kind of where their stuck points. So just on that note, that is one of the things we're doing is just trying to help cities take better advantage of the tools out there to make it easier to entitle projects. Um, and then the other thing on point is we just had a presentation to our one of our policy committees on our other to residential toolkit. So we, we did a toolkit about converting non-residential uses to residential. It'll be published later this fall. So again, we want to make sure that we get it out to you all, but it's stuff you're looking at, but it, it's really meant to be a how-to guide for cities and some of the pitfalls. And we have some really cool case studies. And we looked at big box retail. We looked at gas stations. Uh, we looked at golf courses, which we know is controversial, but hey, people are looking at them. Yeah. Um, we looked at some like neighborhood strip centers, like the traditional LA, Southern California strip. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then brownfields. We looked at brownfields. So um, happy to, to report we're all aligned kind of in thinking of the issues. So I just want to share those resources with you. Yeah, I just listened to a seminar on um, schools and motels, sure, hotels. Sure. I mean, people are starting to pull ideas yeah. from everywhere because yeah. it, we are sort of desperate with the huge numbers of homeless and the huge numbers. Well, yeah. first of all, the cost of a home is ridiculous yeah. in California. Yeah. <laughs> so poor buyers, I feel sorry yeah. for them. With Everything's going against them to try and get into a yeah. home. And now, by the way, Jenna, did you say that those toolkits are available on the SCAG website? They're not, so they're not, not yet. So the, the development streamlining one is actually in development now. Like we have a consultant working on it. So again, I, I think if it's Sonia, we just, I'm going to make sure that, um, again, if you get our e-blast, you'll start just getting the information. Particularly, we have a monthly housing newsletter, and it's just a good way to like generally know what we're doing. So when we publish stuff, but I'll forward um, to Sonia a recent email on the other residential toolkit. We, we had a presentation on it. It's just not published yet. It's, you know, being cleaned up. Um, but um, yeah, and I, I saw one more question in the chat that I wanted to put.
put over to Jacob on our housing trust fund and kind of how we're developing that piece of the work. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I see that. Uh, just it's a question to talk more about the housing trust fund initiative that we're looking to stand up within the, the REAP 2.0 funds. Right now, we're uh, out engaging with cities, counties, existing trust funds, other uh, entities that utilize trust funds to develop housing, to hear how to best um, design programs that would support uh, current and existing efforts and the interest around developing further efforts. So this, for instance, includes you know, how can we help out existing trust fund portfolios that may have projects that are in need of some additional financing in order to get the project over the finish line? It could be around helping with technical assistance and support to stand up a sub-regional or regional uh, collective effort for a housing trust fund. And it could be uh, with knowledge and expertise, again, with consulting or funding for cities and counties in order to identify funding sources for you know, permanent allocations into trust funds um, so that we could look at more of a holistic, uh, maintainable uh, structure and system funding housing uh, for the long term. Um, so that's a little bit of information on the trust fund. I just wanted to mention, uh, many of you, thank you, are, are putting your email addresses in the chat and I'm, I'm gathering them. So if you are interested in receiving updates from us, feel free to just drop your, your email in the chat and, and we'll add you to our list. Anyone else? Oh, Karen has her hand up, Karen. Oh. You know, I have to ask you a question, Jenna. <laughs> so, make, it, make it a tough one, Karen. <laughs> it, well, the challenges are real. And I will give a shout out also to my former Metro Service Council colleague, Rosalba Gonzalez, who joined us a little bit late, but is here okay. today as well. So this is a big reunion. But I so appreciate the resources you're providing to cities. But you know, where I see the challenge for cities is around the community, right? So you have a housing development, you have a reuse project, whatever it is, right? And from Burbank, Sonia, is such a tough place where you have so many more jobs than you have housing units right and then of course the city of los angeles just a challenge all across the board are you guys providing some support to cities on how to navigate those community conversations because that's where it breaks down right you have plans you have ideas and then you have one of these awful community meetings or hearings and everybody's up in arms and the yard signs go up and the whole thing you know kind of devolves into fewer units or or not what it could be you know it's different from what's needed so what are you guys doing around that Sure, a couple of things. So for, first of all, when we provide funding to cities to do their land use planning, they include robust engagement efforts, right? I mean, it, uh, it, that kind of engage, engagement and, and education and working with stakeholders has to happen at the city level. So all of the funding that's been going to the cities, and again, the first grant, the 47 million, tons of money around doing land use planning. And, and I mean, city of LA in particular had a really robust program where they work with Liberty Hill Foundation to then work with community-based organizations to do more grassroots um, organizing. So that was a model we love. We also, with our first grant, did this call for collaboration. We worked with the California Community Foundation. They leveraged other foundation funding. And we put we awarded community-based organizations and nonprofits funding to look at housing policy issues to do grassroots organizing. So again, the idea is to push money down um, to do, and we, we believe engagement and education really is, is one of the ways that we, we can support. We, we, we're not going to do the direct outreach. Um, the other thing, and I think we have someone on the call who mentioned he was participating in the Housing Policy Leadership Academy. So we funded with our first grant eight cohorts subregionally. So we have eight different groups. They, they range from 20 to 40 people. I think we have about 325 people participating across the region in a really intensive Housing Policy Leadership Academy. It's 10 months. They meet three hours once a month, um, and it goes deep into housing policy, housing development issues, and it's not it's not meant to be your standard. It's not meant to be like a housing developer who already knows this stuff. It's meant to be folks, and particularly as I know there's a lot of healthcare people on, right? And you all know that health and housing are intersectional. So how do we make you better advocates, right? Because what your local elected officials need is people to show up in support, right? Because generally the people who show up are the people who are not in support. And it doesn't mean people aren't supportive, it's just they don't know how to show up. So these housing policy leadership academies are meant to be cross-sectoral, get a broad base. They have planning commissioners, they have elected officials, they have community organizations, 
key, you know, businesses that want to get involved. And so they're getting this training to form these pro-housing coalitions in their own communities. So, and we actually just won an award this week from the National Association of Regional Councils, which the unfortunate acronym is NARC. Um, but then we just got an award for that program. Congratulations, uh, right? despite that name. <laughs> despite that name. So th those are the ways, again, we're sitting as a, you know, I come from more at the mu local municipal level. So sitting at the regional level, we're trying to, it's, and I also want to note, we're open to ideas of how we could better support our cities, but those are the things we've been doing. And I mentioned this new grant through the new, the new program, this call for equity, civic engagement and environmental justice it's gonna be similar and bigger than that first call that we did, but it is focused on getting deeper ties to community-based organizations, um, you know, to build supportive coalitions around the work. So let me, let me kind of yeah. uh, wrap up a little bit here. We have a few more minutes, but I do yeah. wanna tie into what you just said, Jenna. Um, one of the initiatives that this committee took on was a, a campaign called mm -hmm. Housing Creates Communities. Our whole idea, and it speaks to what Karen was referring to, mm -hmm. is that, you know, city council members and all these municipalities have a lot of pushback from the NIMBYs that don't want housing. And so how do you educate the broader public about this need? So uh, among other things, the Alliance, we were doing some social media stuff and so on and getting some good traction, but also we created these beautiful street banners that say cool. teachers need housing, first responders need housing and so on. City of San Fernando has take, taken that up. It's right. been much bigger challenge in the city of LA and some of the other cities. And partly it's that we don't have funding to you know, um, print the banners and, and have them hung. And we were told by, I talked to all the LA city council members in the Valley, um, their deputies and so on. They all referred me to this, I forget street, mm -hmm. street lighting or whoever handles banners. You know, there's 66,000 applications a year and there's this huge process. It's like, oh my gosh, we'll never get these done. So we could use some funding. I don't know if SCAG's interested in this, but the whole idea is to sort of co communicate this message to the larger public that, well, yeah, I want to have the teachers in my community have housing so they can teach at my public school or, yeah, you know, those young professionals, whatever. I mean, they're, they're really lovely, you know, um, designs, students and so on. So at any rate, I'm just throwing it out there, Skag, in case that's of interest yeah. to you, you know. <laughs> I hope yeah. that's okay, so, Sonia. Course, no, it, it, it is, of course, again, we don't, we don't get to that micro level, but no, no, that I, I get feels it. like- I, It's the funding for. to do it kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, so the, we yeah. have the contacts with the cities, but it's just a matter of yeah. getting them posted, so. No, I, I understand. Yeah. I'm just saying in terms of funding, like we wouldn't have a program that specific, but that could yeah. fit in. I, I, I can't speak to the top of my head. I don't know if Jacob can about eligibility, like for printing yeah. banners, but that's yeah. an engagement thing. Again, yeah. that feels like it fits into call for, right? That feels like it fits into this call for civic engagement, equity, and environmental justice. Um, so if you, again, we're, we've got all of these emails coming at us, so we'll get you on mailing lists. So okay. track that program, because especially sure. if you get city partners that say, yeah, we'll do it. If you can help get some funding, um, yeah. that, that feels like something that would be, you know, an eligible um, program. Yeah, sounds good. All right. And I know I got one more question from, okay. is it Mira? Mira? Myra or Mira? Thank you, Jenna. It's Myra. Myra, okay. You had a question uh, about low-income elderly housing. Yes. Well, uh, some elderly who live in uh, for very long time in apartment buildings, they pay and apartments that are under rent control, and they do pay rent. And rent is increasing every year, about three point two five percent, I believe. Um, it's get to point that they're constantly increasing and elderly people cannot keep up. In my neighborhood, I'm talking to many people uh, and it's very difficult uh, how long it's going to increase. It will get to point that this elderly individual over age 66 cannot afford to pay rent anymore on the social security retirement income. What is, how to handle this situation? Is it any programs that we can uh, create maybe specific because everyone focus on a uh, younger generation homeless but no one thinking that this elderly population mm -hmm. can end up being yeah. homeless 
So you have and a great been, point. And we, we've got some limited time, it, Ira. So could I have Jenna respond quickly just because we're we're getting close to the end here. So great question. Totally. Yeah. Again, uh, I, we need to do. I, I mean, I think uh, the SCAG, we don't get quite at that micro level, but I could tell you Jacob might have something on this. Um, it sounds like those are rent controlled units and those are the legally allowed rent increases, but um, it sounds like either A, this when we're talking about preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing, so just housing out there that's more affordable is a key strategy for this community to make sure those units kind of stay even slightly affordable. And there's been some interest in nonprofits buying up some of those buildings to hold the rents. And there's actually some new state funding coming down the pike focused on nonprofits and community land trusts buying up those buildings um, to try to maintain them from a more community perspective. The other piece is all of the housing that, that is looking to be built has a large affordability component and there is low income senior housing that gets built. So there is housing that is built and the rents are held lower and it targets um, senior citizens, the elderly. So that is one form of affordable housing that is supported um, through um, all the programs being funded. So say the housing trust funds can fund um, low income elderly housing. I mean, those are some of the solutions. I, that isn't gonna fix the problem in the moment, but those are the, some of the ones that come to mind. Sure. And then okay. Jake, if you want to add, uh, I, I think we're, I, well, I, I'm, me, I'm sorry, to... but we have to kind of wrap up. We're, we're, we only have a couple of minutes, so I, I need to kind of wrap up. But thank you, though, for your good question. Is there anything else you want to add, Jacob? Because Jenna mentioned you might have some additional information. Well, I do want to say that I believe I've captured everyone's email uh, who have dropped it in the chat. Thank you so much. And, and I think Jenna summed it up nicely. It is part, part of a broader ranging strategy. You know, I think housing is important at all levels, all income levels and all ages. So um, thank you for uh, allowing us the time to be here with you and joining sure. today. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to have you both uh, Jenna and Jacob. Very informative. So glad to have this information. Um, just very quickly, we have about a minute. Um, Sonia, are there any upcoming events we should publicize that uh, the rest of the group should know about? Um, sure, I'll put in the chat also, um, definitely our next uh, Livable Sustainable Communities meeting uh, called Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, where we're gonna look at and have speakers talking about the nexus between uh, financial and physical health and how to uh, look at buying one's first home, what buyers home buying assistance programs are available, et cetera, et cetera. So more information will be on our website. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much to everybody. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to introduce. I know a number of people uh, came in a little bit late, but so glad you could join us and hope you will come back next month um, to our next meeting. So thank you, everybody, and uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks, you too, Maria. Thanks, Thanks you. Jenna, Jacob, Bruce. Thank you all. Have a great day. You think we could get a copy of her slides? Yes, those will be on our website uh, okay. later on today. And okay, we'll have you. them sent out to everyone who registered. Thank you. All right. You bet, Nancy. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.